Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Revealed. This week was actually a pretty good week in the shop. We were able to take out a lot of the stuff that we had piling up here and deliver it to finish. The size of our shop has been kind of talked about a lot lately and we only have about 2,400 square feet in this shop with uh, the offices and bathrooms taking up probably about 400 square feet of that. So we are very tight for space in here with this massive project that we're undertaking right now. A lot of our cabinetry piled up very quickly, making it very tight in here. We were able to get a lot of that out this week and send it over to finish, making some room in here for us to work on the next portion of this project, which we're gonna jump into in a second. But we've been getting a lot of questions on what hardware that we're using. So since I have some of the kitchen cabinets still right behind me, let's just dig right into some of those pieces of hardware. So directly behind me, we have the corner cabinet. This is going to be used in an application where two perpendicular runs meet right in the corner. And typically you might have some dead space there. You might opt to use a Lazy Susan. We aren't big fans of the Lazy Susans here. And instead we opt to use what's called a Magic Corner or Le Mans. Both of those are our go-to units. This one in particular is a Magic Corner. This is the Magic Corner 1. They also have a Magic Corner 2. The difference is the Magic Corner 1 will mount to an actual door, whereas the Magic Corner 2 gets hinged and you would open the door and then pull out the shelving unit. What's really nice about this particular unit is you can pull out this first run of shelving here, push it off to the side, and it will pull forward the shelving that's kind of tucked away in this back corner utilizing some of that otherwise dead space or hard to reach space. And it gives you full access to additional storage, a lot of overflow for maybe some pots and pans or just some other items that may not be used too often. You can store them away and still have full access to them when you do need them. Another nice thing about this unit is all the shelves are very easily adjustable. Just lift it up, drop it back into place. Another corner unit that we like to use a lot is the Le Mans unit and that one's a little bit different shaped so the functionality is the same except the shelving is actually one piece that is sort of kidney shaped so you have a storage here and it loops back so you have storage out here in the front that loops back into the cabinetry using the same kind of mechanism where as you open that door it pulls all the shelving forward making it all very easily accessible those units are also great they are very smooth operating. The one drawback to them is adjusting the shelves is a little bit more difficult than the Magic Corner, but I think the Le Mans operates a bit smoother than the Magic Corner. So there's a couple of pros and cons to each unit. One of the other great features about both this Magic Corner and the Le Mans unit is they both have an optional soft close. We don't have it installed on this unit just yet. So you can see it kind of snaps back into place but there is an attachment for a soft close that will pull these units in nice and smoothly. Set up right next to our magic corner here, we have our trash unit. This is the unit that we probably use most often and most consistently. So this unit would be mounted to the door. So once you pull the door out, this trash unit will come right out with it. This one here is the larger model. There are several variations depending on the opening width that you have. And this one here is the largest one. The two larger barrels are about 40 quarts and with two smaller ones for additional storage. Another great thing about these units is it actually has this metal barrier that helps prevent any smells or anything from creeping up into the cabinet. One of the things that we also like to do with our trash unit cabinets is add an additional what we call dust bottom, basically just a divider between drawers and in this case, between the trash and the drawer above. Since there's so much extra space here, we don't want it to go to waste. So oftentimes we'll add a drawer right above it. So another thing we like to do with our trash units is actually mount a servo drive behind them. What that's going to do is with just a slight touch, push that drawer open for us. So you can imagine you're doing some prep work in the kitchen for dinner, you have your hands full, you need to open your trash, you know you're gonna be juggling the scrap food, dropping it everywhere. You can just bump that trash unit and it'll open up for you. You can drop your trash right in. Makes things a little bit easier for you. One last bit about hardware before we move on. Whenever we're mounting hinges, we have switched over about a year or two ago 
to using all these horizontal plates. Now, a lot of people don't even know that they exist, but what they actually do is allow for a nice clean streamlined look once that hinge is installed. You do have to go ahead and mount the plates ahead of time. I know with the wing plates, it's easy to kind of mount them once the door is actually attached to the hinges because you'll have access to the screws. Here, they're all hidden behind the arm of the hinge. But this also shows you another thing that I talk about a lot where we always try to hide the screws that are holding cabinets together or the screws that are mounting the cabinets to the wall, things like that. This is where I like to hide the screws when I'm screwing cabinets together. So I'll put them right in the front of the hinge plate so that they're always accessible, never behind the hinge plate because once you do install the hinge, if you need to take that cabinet apart for any reason, now you're having to undo all of the hinge plates in order to access those screws. So I put them right in front, and then once that hinge pops on, you're never gonna see those screws regardless of whether the door is closed or open. Since we're gonna have a couple weeks worth of finish time, our priority was to get all of the finished items out of the shop and over to finish before moving on to some of the items that didn't need to be finished. For example, a couple weeks ago, we talked about some of the issues we had with using the Fenix laminates and we kind of put those on the back burner so we could focus on the painted stuff. And now with all of that out of the shop, and we can jump back in to correct some of these Fenix issues, as well as some of the other things that we didn't get to before. So what you see in front of me is the hood cabinet. This is going to go directly above our cooktop. And this piece here is actually the under cabinet skin. This is the piece that's going to cover the underside of the cabinet so that you don't see any of the raw plywood edges or the color difference in the materials. Since we are going with this gray material, you don't wanna see the transition into the bright maple when you look under your cabinets. Yes, there's not a lot of room left in this cabinet, but we wanted to keep the design cohesive throughout the project, but we didn't wanna open that cabinet and see that hood insert staring right back at us. So what we did is we covered it up and we left as much room as we could so that the homeowner can store things like additional spices or extra filters for the hood. If we remove this box, you can see that we do have the bottom of our cabinet is notched out for the hood insert. We now also need to cut that opening into our under cabinet skin, which is what we're getting set up to do next. Since we have cabinets flanking either side of this hood cabinet, we just need to go ahead and lay that out and then we can come back and cut into that opening. We're gonna do this with a template and a router so that each of these cuts are nice and clean. Even though there will be a flange on that insert that will hide the cut, we always wanna make sure that our cuts are nice and clean. We're gonna do this same process for the cooktop as well as the sink since both the counters are this same Fenix material. Now with some space in the shop, we can work on the last bit of this project. We started to show you guys before some of the white laminates that we were using for the utility kind of areas, the workshop and then some tall storage cabinetry. This here's the last piece of that where this is the desk in the workshop. So we have this U-shaped desk. It's captured by three walls where this section here goes wall to wall. The back section goes wall to wall. But this side here in front of me is going to remain open. This space here is adjacent to the living room. So if you were sitting in the living room, you would actually be able to see into this space. So we have a series of bifold doors that will cover this entire space. It will match the cabinetry that's next to it. And once you open these doors up, you have full access to this entire workshop space. And then when you have company or if you're done in the workshop, you can go ahead and close those doors up, keeping this all out of sight since it is rather utilitarian. On the inside, right above the two cabinet areas, we're going to have this floating adjustable shelving. The channels are going to actually be recessed into the walls but you are still able to lift that shelving up, tilt it just a little bit and adjust it wherever you would need. You can see that there's a ton of blue tape on all of our cabinets here. That's because each one has a mitered return on the front. And here in our shop, when we're gluing up mitered returns, we typically use a couple different types of tape to get those miters. You'll see on this front one here, it does have two mitered ends. That's because this side is seen when those doors are open, so we return that countertop to give us a nice finished look. So that's what's going on in the shop right now. If you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them below, hit us up on Instagram. Every week we do go live answering those questions on Instagram, so please check out for that. And if you're liking the show, 
please let a friend know about it and hit that subscribe button. So stay tuned for last week's Q&A. Welcome everyone, Q&A section of Revealed. So a few questions this week for you, Ken. Sure. One answer, one of these questions has been covered, I feel, at nauseum, but new MT Copeland stuff. New MT Copeland stuff. Um, yep, so we, we filmed the second course um, about a month ago, actually, and it should be out late June is when it will be released. Late June. So about another month, month and a week or so. Pop it on the calendar. Yep, um, in, in this course we talk about how to build face frames, that was a huge question, face frames and shaker doors. So we got a lot of questions on that. We're building, um, we build a small vanity. So we do a beaded face frame and a beaded shaker door. So uh, we kind of run through everything on how to select and process rough lumber. Okay. Throughout door, jo door joinery, um, how to make the face frames, running the details, running the beads, assembly, everything. And if you can't wait, till then which you should because it's going to be much more detailed than this video but we actually did an episode of crafted and it's builders original series there uh kind of about what ken just covered just not going into as much detail as the mt copeland series and i think um, way back too we did a how to build shaker doors think of that one yeah back when we were using a router table yeah um now we're using shapers but you know years ago we only had a router table which it's great for a lot of smaller shops who, who don't have shapers and they can see how it's done on a router table. So the new one, we're using the shaper, right? Yeah. So there's a little bit of a, a difference there. We're using router bits right. to some extent, yeah. um, for, for some of them anyway, but then for our door profiles. Oh no, I used uh, router bits for everything actually on that one. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll put the link to that video in the YouTube description. Uh, and if you guys have questions, throw them out now and you got them. Uh, I think this is a question we've also covered, but I think it's a good one. Um, so when you're putting in kitchen cabinets, are you putting plywood over studs or are you putting in strategic blocking? Yeah, we put in strategic blocking. So when the walls are opened up, when there's right, when it's just gutted, so it's just studs, yeah. we're going in at our typical locations. Um, Right, we know what the location of the countertop height is going to be, as well as the uppers, yep. at this point. Yep. Um, and if things change a little bit, we do have a little bit of room to play. You know, typically I think it's like a two by six or about a six inch rip of plywood that we're putting in for blocking, and we just screw those into the studs on either side and continue that through the whole run. So a lot of the times you're looking to chase a stud, mm -hmm. trying to find a stud in the wall to hang your cabinets from and there's never a stud where you need it, right? You, you usually want to kind of keep your cap, your screws hidden a little bit, keep them off to the corners. There's not always a screw there, especially when you're going into, you know, a corner of the room. Mm. You're not going to have a corner in the stud, all the, uh, a stud in the corner all the time. So your cabinet, your upper cabinet could just be kind of flopping on one side. Mm. Obviously you don't want that. So yeah, we go ahead and put blocking through the entire project where things get kind of like, so in a kitchen, we have our standard heights and sizes, right? In things like an office or any other kind of miscellaneous cabinetry, mm -hmm. it could vary wildly, right? So we, we make sure to kind of take into account all of this from the start so that we can accommodate various locations and uh, set ourselves up for success when it does come time for cabinets. Mm -hmm. Another thing though, document it. We Pictures. We, yep. We've been... We've had pictures before where it's like, oh shoot, I thought I had blocking in here. Or if there's like a funky plumbing situation or something, take photos, take your tape measure and lay everything out so you can see distance from floor, distance from walls, whatever it is, any kind of like marker that would give you, like identify where your pieces are. Okay. Um, that's been super helpful. We've, we've run into a situation where we didn't have photos and it's been kind of tricky. So what is the benefit <laughs> to doing strategic blocking instead of plywood? Well now, given the, the cost of plywood now, maybe it's cost, <laughs> right? <but> before <laughs> the current state. Well, I mean, I guess two buys are up there too, right? Yeah, that, yeah. I guess you're um, damned if you do. Yeah, I think just putting in the blocking is a little bit easier. Since we're using two buys, it's a much larger material that we're screwing into. We're able to screw it into the sides of those studs. Um, with the plywood, it would be, what is it, like an additional layer over your studs. Yeah. 
or yeah, we we have put blocking in plywood blocking in in between the studs before, mm. but now you're dealing with only three quarters okay. of an inch to grab onto rather than the inch and a half from a stud. So it just it provides a little extra grabbing power and uh, you know a little bit more to screw into from the studs. Are you putting in the blocking or the framers? So we were doing it with the framers that we were leaving that up to them. On the last project, the Cambridge project, that the last couple episodes have revealed have been about, it's such a huge project that it's been, everybody's been super busy on it. So we actually had James, our lead installer, go over there and install all the blocking um, for us. It worked out so well that we're kind of changing how we do that. And now we're gonna have James or someone from our cabinetry team go in to install all the blocking ahead of time during this process. So, uh, I got a phone call. Ken's getting phone calls Sorry. just to Hollywood here. <laughs> Did you see who it was though? It went too it fast. Hollywood, I don't know. Um, so I think what this person is asking, you're referring to our cabinet team putting them in, right? Mm -hmm. Not the framers. This is a renovation, but yeah. I think what he might've been getting at is During the framer, framer you're framing a new house, are the framers putting in? No, I think in that case, we would still be doing our own blocking. So it's either the, our, our carpentry team or the cabinetry install. Team. Yeah, but that kind of brings up a good point is we got quite a few new builds coming up, ground up builds, so not renovations. We'll have to kind of chat with the framing teams and see if it makes sense for them to put them in. We're gonna know the locations. All right. So that might be a, a nice test. See what works there best. There we go. Um, Coughlin says, sup guys, sup dude. Sup. <laughs> How you living? All right, SketchUp, Cabinet Vision, or 2020? Yeah, I'm, I'm a SketchUp guy. Those are all guy. programs, right? Yeah, they're all like I've the I've never kitchen. heard of 2020. They're cabinetry, kitchen design kind of programs, okay. um, specifically. They're, I mean, to my knowledge, I don't know much about uh, Cabinet Vision or 2020, but I know a lot of like kitchen showrooms use that kind of software. Like if you were to so more like a rendering, I guess, or no, you can still do all like the same okay. layouts. It's just, I think they have a library of cabinet sizes where it's a little bit easier to pull from and pull the profiles and you can do the same in SketchUp. You just, what we're doing is a little bit more custom. And the reason that I use SketchUp is when we have a, a weird detail that we need to work through and I need to see it in 3d, mm. um, that's where the SketchUp comes in helpful for me. And it's the only one I know. I mean, a lot of other people use some of these other programs. It's just SketchUp happens to be the one that I chose to. Guessing there's going to be a lot larger online community for SketchUp as opposed to these other two as well, from a forum standpoint or a support standpoint. I don't know. The other, they're 2020 and Cabinet Vision. They're bigger programs oh, okay. too. Yeah. So right, um, never mind. I mean, I'm sure it's there's stuff out there. Yeah. All right. Well, either way you go, it seems. How detailed are you getting in SketchUp? with your drawings? Pretty detailed. Most of the time that I'm looking to um, use SketchUp is because it's a tricky detail. Yep. So we need to kind of see the whole thing in 3D to really understand how these pieces are gonna work together. So we try to get detail. I mean, we're not putting in like screw locations or you know getting hinge locations and things like that into SketchUp. It's more so all of our parts and pieces and how they work together, not not detailed to like the, the micro level where we are putting in every last shelf pinhole, things like that. Okay. And we'll just go back to jigs. Jigs. We use a ton of jigs. So in these cabinets here behind me, the one on the end over here, or just past them, is full of various jigs. We always save them. Um, we have another cabinet across the shop here that's also full of jigs, templates for everything. I mean, we use so much so many jigs and we often save them because we're using a lot of the same products, right? So if we have one particular edge poles, right? We covered edge poles in the last episode of Revealed too. Yep. We use a jig to make those. And I think there was a few different sizes that we've shown over the last couple episodes. We keep each one because chances are we're gonna use that one again. Hmm. Not that they take a long time to build. If there is a large jig that kind of gets in the way, we're not going to save it, if, especially if it's like a one-off type of thing. Mm. Um, but most of them we do try to hang on to because chances so are So what do you do? You do kind of label it by um, manufacturer, like yeah. MSEC yeah. hardware, such and such. Exactly. That, Store it. that, and then like another thing that comes to mind is when we do arched toe kicks, we have jigs for that. So we'll keep them with, you know, oh, this one's a three-inch radius or, you know, whatever that radius is. Yeah. Um, 
just so we know, and sometimes we will put the job number on there too. So it's like, oh, this is the one we used on project 271. Now, mm -hmm. I, now I know what, what that is, you know, it gives us a little bit of a reference of what the, the end look is going to be. And there was a, I think there's a little confusion um, in the Q&A last week when you were talking about um, sanding cabinet doors, mm -hmm. um, where you guys break the edge. Yep. And you were talking about how you don't want to round the edge. And yep. someone was like, well, why don't you want to round the edge? And he, I think he was referring to breaking the edge. So is there kind of a difference there? So what I would interpret rounding the edge as uh, is taking like a round over bit on your router uh, and actually adding a round profile to the edge of the door. Right. That's what I'm, I would assume. I just don't know if that was like a phrase thing where he's thinking rounding the edge is breaking the edge and it's just kind of a... He, he very well could be. Yeah. Um, maybe we can reach out and ask, right? Make sure... Yeah, I just thought it'd be a good topic but, for conversation. Yeah, so we're, we're breaking the edge and what that is is it's very slight round over. So when you're milling up your lumber, it gets so sharp, you're you can run your hand across it and actually like tear your skin, right? Because it's almost razor sharp. And we obviously don't want that, right? It's gonna cause, you know, injury. You're gonna get like paper cuts, you know, things like that or paper cut type injuries. Um, and then it actually, the finish doesn't stick well on a sharp corner like that. So rounding them over, it, it helps in a number of different ways. Um, it's a very light round over called breaking the edge. When somebody talks about rounding the edges, I, I feel like that's more of a, okay. a profile difference. Gotcha. Um, but what I had actually meant, and you know, we can try to clarify that a little bit, is in our case, our door thickness is one inch. So we have a one inch wide door. When you're operating with a six inch sander, on your one inch, you're, you're very likely to tip yep. instead of keeping your sander perfectly flat. Yep. And that's not just going to you know, round that outside edge, it's gonna change the whole square edge of that profile. And most of the time you're not gonna ride the, the whole length of the door, so you're just gonna kinda of dip a little bit here and there. And you're gonna end up with a really wavy door where the sander digs into it because it's very easy to remove a lot of material very quickly, mm -hmm. unintentionally, when you are making that pass and you kinda of tilt your sander just a little bit. And then you won't have a flat edge of your door, especially if it's the front edge of your door where you need your profile and your lines to all line up. Mm -hmm. you know, now you're gonna have this wavy line going up through and get you in a lot of trouble. Curveball, coming at you. You want your curveball, <laughs> huh, everyone? The millwork hierarchy. Where do you see millwork fitting in the overall hierarchy of home design? As a level of importance? I think it's up there and I think it's it's trending higher in importance. I think over the last, you know, several years, um, it's become more and more, uh, I don't wanna say mainstream, but like popular. Like I think that's fair. There's always been, you know, the high-end homes had beautiful millwork packages. Mm -hmm. And I think we're starting to see this trickle down into, you know, lower end, I don't, I don't wanna say lower end homes, but not these like ultra high end homes. You know, it's starting yeah. to kind of. Entry level. Yeah. You know, start at home. You know, make its way into to different class homes. Um, and I, I think it's just going to continue down that path. And especially with things like, with the, the Pinterest and Instagram, all these visual platforms. Okay. Now a lot of these people who didn't know that these high end kitchens existed, you know, or what this product could be mm. are now seeing this and they're like, I want that. That's beautiful. I want it. Do you think, you know, reality TV, like HGTV, you know what I'm talking mm. about. Kind of, I mean, it's been years at this point, that, what, a decade, 12 years, 15 years that they've kind of been pushing out content. Right. Do you think that kind of started the wave of accessibility and then social media just kind of wrote it and now it is the wave, but from me, from an idiot standpoint, someone who's kind of an outsider to this, my my introduction into, you know, kitchens and bathrooms and selling homes and that stuff was HGTV. Right. The reality TV side of things. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably what, I think they kind of go hand in hand, right? A lot of the people that are seeing this on HGTV are maybe going into- Well, now, now it's social, but I, I'm right. just saying you know, years started. ago, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I could certainly see that. Um, 
Yeah, because if you're saying 10, 12 years ago on Instagram, it's probably been a little bit less than that, that the home building and building industry in general has become really popular on Instagram. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, socials have probably kind of taken it to that next level. Hmm. But yeah, I could definitely see that. And then we all know the flaw with HGTV is that everybody thinks very all this work can get yeah. done in like Six 60 weeks. minutes. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> you, you can't do that in a half hour? Yeah. No, no. Right. Um, do you have any more wine cellars in the pipeline? What? My post today, right? Uh, Not that I know of. Yeah, I don't. I haven't heard anything, but no. I mean, if you want one, we're always open to. If you want to check out the one we did, we have a lot of videos on that NS Builders YouTube. That one, that's crazy. That particular one, that's very cool. Um, and this isn't even a question. I kind of wrote this down. So we briefly mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, where how you're starting to do video editing yourself. Mm -hmm. And video editing is considered like an invisible art. If you're doing your job, people aren't noticing yeah. um, the editing. They're caught up in the story. The content, yeah. Do you feel, in a way, mill work is kind of an invisible thing, or if it's doing its job, it's just kind of part of the place, part of the space, and not, not necessarily, maybe I guess it can be a focal point, but. See, I'm biased, though, because I do it, so I want it to be the focal point. Um, but it has to work in the space, right? You can't just go into a home and like, oh, I want this because that's what I want. I think a lot of times a home is going to tell you mm. what you need to do in that space. And I'm sure every designer that ends up seeing this is probably like, yes, exactly. Um, or I'm totally wrong and they're all just like, no, you have no idea what you're talking about and that could be so you're, true. You're kind of just saying don't f force it, I guess. Right. It kind of has to flow naturally. If it's well designed, it's not going to stand out as bad or out of place and i think if it's designed well and it's executed well it could either it could go both ways where it, it just looks so natural that it doesn't you know jump out at you or it's going to look great where it's like holy cow that's amazing that's you know beautiful this is kind of a fun question i just oh. thought of and we'll end on this unless you guys have some more questions um we'll end on this what is something when someone walks into a kitchen, what is something you can tell them right now like, to look for? Like, hey, if, they, if that kitchen was done right, this looks really good. And if it wasn't, you know, I'm not saying that they did a bad job, but maybe they just missed a mark. Is there something that's kind of a, a quick telltale? So, uh, yeah, the first thing that jumps out to me is, but it's a very specific type of kitchen. Mm. If it's a wood-toned kitchen, it's the grain matching. Mm. If you walk in, you know, the pieces are, all over the place and there's nothing that matches it's to me and I, i've i've ruined cabinetry for some people by showing them this pointing it out and like i i kid you not i will get messages or texts from people that are just like saw this in a hotel i can't stand it and it's just you know <laughs> misaligned pieces or whatever it is and um it's the green matching mm. you know this is something that you know i kind of chatted with nick about very early on here it's the homeowner's job isn't to necessarily understand why it looks better, but we want them to know that it looks better. So when they walk in and like, wow, this, this looks amazing, this looks better than that. Mm. But they don't know why. That's, but they appreciate it. But they appreciate it. Yeah. And that's kind of the goal, right? Or, you know, it's great to kind of hear these things because it's, they know there's something better about it. Invisible art. Exactly. <laughs> and it's not their job to know why. But once you point it out to them, they're just like, oh my God. It's like, pulling the veil back, you know, and I kid you not, people well, that, will reach out about it. That actually, that is a parallel. Like if you're watching a Hollywood film, you're not noticing the editing. Right. But if you watch somebody on YouTube, like, like my our, videos are going to be. Our <laughs> videos included where you're just doing jump cuts to yeah. cut out whatever, spacing or whatever, it's more noticeable. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait till you see mine, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. The thing I, real quick, yeah. from an outsider, through osmosis, the thing I notice now in mm -hmm. kitchens is spacing mm -hmm. around appliances. So that was going to be my next. And then thing. reveals on like doors and yep. how cabinet doors sit on yeah. hinges or. That was going to be my more broad kind of answer is yeah. the, the spacing. Like if you walk in and doors are misaligned everywhere, that's. Or if there's like a two inch gap around the stove or right. whatever.
Well, and too, a lot of these places are, when you're buying cabinets from, you know, somebody, a manufacturer, they're sold in what, like three inch increments. Mm. So when you have a wall and it kind of falls into this awkward sizing spacing, you end up with these oversized fillers in certain areas because they don't have a cabinet or a series of cabinets that equal that space any better. Mm. So you end up with these large, awkward shaped kind of fillers. Yeah, and that's not me um, disparaging kitchens that have weird spacing um, no, at, I don't at all. <laughs> it's just something I notice now. Yeah. Not so much. Yeah. Ruining cabinetry since what? Since Jeez, 2017 here? 17, something like that. Well, thank you for joining everyone. It's probably been about 20 minutes, so really appreciate you guys joining. Um, we will try to do this at the same time next week. Someone just joined and said, hi, y'all. <laughs> Bye, y'all. <laughs>